Dave Ramsey is somewhat of a very famous motivational and money coach based out of the US. His whole philosophy is to get people out of debt as quickly as possible and building wealth. Now in this video, I want to cover in particular one of his baby steps, which is a progression of six steps towards freedom and wealth. One of them talks about investing. I'm gonna break down what he advises with regards to investing, how much you should actually put towards your investments when you're in that stage of building your wealth, but also what type of investments he recommends and advises people the most. I'll also give you my view on his investment strategy and whether or not it's actually a good one. Hi there, welcome back to my channel today. So I've touched upon, you might have heard of this guy called Dave Ramsey, very famous. His baby steps are often regarded as the way to get out of debt if you're considering an alternative to perhaps having to try and cope on your own. Now, he has a very particular step that says once you've actually cleared your debt, you have built an emergency fund, you've got also three to six months of emergency savings. Emergency savings being enough to live off should your life change in some way where you couldn't have your normal day job. So that would be three to six months of your bills being paid, the house kept over your head, food, basic essentials, allowing you to kind of change your circumstances, look for other employment. So his particular step with to do with investments that comes after all those steps says that you should invest 15% of your household income. Now that's the only rule that's actually listed. However, if you ever watched his YouTube channel or listened to his radio show, you will know he also gives a little bit extra advice with investing. So his passion in investing is actually to use mutual funds. Now he recommends these over index funds, which is a very controversial, interesting view to have indeed. So I'm going to break down the differences between mutual funds then and index funds so we get a bigger picture of what he's talking about. If you want to dive in a little bit deeper, I go a step back and have a stock market for beginners video that would be really great for you. It's in my best of playlist. So go and have a watch of that and then come back to this one. But essentially the difference between index funds and mutual funds, which is obviously a way to invest in the stock market, index funds are tracking a market. Their whole job passively and passively being that nobody is managing it for you. You don't have an account manager or an active manager doing the selection for you. It happens in the background. It's very passive and a lot of companies have them because they're excellent. They're low cost and they do that all for you. So an index fund tracks a market and its whole point is to match that market that is tracking. So essentially, let's think about the S&P 500, which is a very famous index fund. Its whole job is to track the top performing 500 companies within the US. So it's essentially a league table. The companies within that can basically come in and go as much as they please because it's tracking the top 500. Once a day, that fund will then buy appropriately proportioned amounts of each of those 500 different stocks and make that one fund to track the performance overall of what that market did that day. It happens once a day. Obviously with mutual funds, what happens is then the opposite. So these are actively managed funds. Now a fund is essentially a whole range of different stocks. So it's not just one company you're buying, you're actually buying perhaps a different sector, you're buying perhaps different industries altogether, you're perhaps buying index funds, everything can be thrown in, bonds you can have in there as well, lots of different merged different commodities you're buying with that one piece of a fund. Now, mutual funds, as I said, are managed by somebody in the background. They have a human element. Therefore, we have added costs for that benefit. Now, really, the mutual fund manager, their whole job, their whole career is to keep their investors happy. They do that by offering better than the stock market, whatever market they're trying, better returns overall. That's their whole purpose. If they weren't managed matching or beating those index funds, then really there'd be no point and nobody would have a job. Their whole sole goal is to give you better returns. So obviously because somebody's managing that for you, as I said, there's higher costs involved. Index funds are very low cost because nobody is looking after that for you. It happens every day on autopilot. Vanguard or Hargreaves Lansdowne just create index funds, whatever they're tracking, the markets, the sectors, and they happen in the background without anyone having to check it. 
mutual funds, however, somebody's actually using their intelligence, their guidance of the stock market, what they think is going to be worth more in the future to give back higher rates of return, that constant evaluation. And for that, compared to index funds, which might have like 0.06 to perhaps up to 0.8% admin charges the longer you hold the fund, when we're looking at mutual funds, we tend to see between one to 2% admin charges. So remember when you buy investments, you're not just buying that stock, that share, that fund, that's the one time price. You'll also have an admin cost and fee, perhaps even fees when you buy and sell. So these are hugely important things because effectively we're giving back the investment company a portion of our growth, our profit, because they're actually doing that work for us. So index funds, of course, there's no work involved. So the cost effectively is very much like a token gesture. It's very small to kind of keep the investment company happy that you're investing with them. With active managers, with mutual funds, they need to pay their wage. They need to pay for their time for you and all their other investors. And that's why charges are much higher. Now, Warren Buffett said a really interesting quote. He said back in 2007, even if your investments were getting eight, 9% year on year growth, and for example, the S&P 500 has seen 9.8%, 8% average year on year growth for the past 100 years. Some years it was minus five, some years it was plus 15, but average means over that length of time, it blended out to 9.8%. If you were getting eight, nine percent, but also paying two or three percent admin charges, that's a huge amount of your money that you're giving to someone else. If you're only paying zero point, let's say 0.5 percent admin charges, more of the money obviously is staying in your pocket. There's also a flip side to that. Because we're working with compound interest and time here, the bigger the pot of money that stays in your hands, the more money effectively will keep growing. So compound interest interest works as the amount that you've got saved at that date and time, let's say a year later, is not just growth based on what you bought, but also growth on the interest or the growth that those stocks have gained. So it keeps multiplying exponentially. So Dave Ramsey will often say he gets 12, 13% from his mutual funds. Now, obviously giving those kind of ratings is outperforming the S&P average. However, when we delve in and he doesn't tell you exactly what he invests in, obviously because that's particular investment advice for his scenario based on risk, goals, we actually could probably find it similar with those index funds. I think he really enjoys mutual funds because of the element of somebody actually looking after it for him. Now, of course, employing someone to actually do that work for you, to find stocks, the bond mix, whatever you want for your criteria, feels like it's giving them the responsibility over your money, making better decisions. However, actually, when we delve a little bit deeper into the index fund market, you will find funds there that would track everything possible that you can imagine. If it's a particular sector that you think is going to be worth more in future, if it's a particular field of industry you think as well, you can find index funds and ETFs that cover those requirements. So to necessarily believe that only a mutual fund will give that specialised knowledge about what things will be worth in future certainly isn't the case. So some would very clearly argue that his advice is wrong for the majority of people. And I'm going to break down some of the reasons he suggests that mutual funds are the better way to go compared to index funds. The first being diversification. Now, if you know anything about the stock market, this word diversification comes in as something of a very much gospel term that you need to understand and apply. Diversification means are you spreading your stocks, your wealth over many different areas so that if anything happens, if one sector crashes or there's a dip in the market, overall you might not be as affected as if you had only invested in that one area. It's kind of like having all your hands in as many pockets at one time. Now the great thing about index funds, as I explained, they have that built-in diversification. For example, if you simply wanted to track the whole global economy, economy, it's going to naturally keep expanding, contracting, expanding. You can actually find one index fund, the global index fund that you can buy that tracks the whole stock market. You can do that by one fund and it's all done for you. Now, if we're tracking the global stock market, you know that naturally the companies that aren't doing so well, the sectors that aren't doing so well either, they're getting filtered out naturally. So there's built-in diversification. Mutual funds don't necessarily give you diversification 
information built in or the only option. This is completely based on somebody's intelligence and somebody's method of gaining wealth for their investors. So if perhaps one month it might have diversification, but then they could change their strategy and want something else, a different blend in there. So yes, in theory, it should be diverse because somebody's thinking of a balanced portfolio, but it certainly isn't the only way to get it. There's also a term, particularly with mutual funds, that's particularly important here, and that's survival ship bias. Now, let me break this down for you. Essentially, it means that a mutual fund will only be around long term if it's returning decent profits to its investors. If it's doing exactly what it says on the tin, it's returning back greater than the stock market returns to its investors. Naturally, if a fund or a manager is not achieving that growth consistently, perhaps over five, 10 years, that fund will shut down and no longer be an option to buy. Therefore, we assume that mutual funds that have been around for 30, 40 years have that survival instinct in them. However, we mustn't forget that index funds have that in some respect automatically as well. Those index funds are tracking top performance or perhaps particular sectors. They're going to have only the ones who are surviving in there. So essentially, that means that index fund might never actually close. There's not a risk of somebody making a wrong choice and making a loss on our money, shutting down the fund. With any type of investment, we know there's a risk it can go up as well as down. So certainly just having it with a mutual fund manager isn't the only way to guarantee that we have less risk because we've got a human doing it for us. If anything, there's a human error rate there that they can make mistakes. We could even potentially lose more of our money because we are also giving charges as well in accordance to their time and value. I believe Dave Ramsey also likes mutual funds over index funds because there's an element of pass the responsibility. So if you watch his show, you will know he's very passionate about people taking control of their money. However, with investments, I actually feel he likes to pass it on to others because perhaps everyday people aren't equipped to understand the market. I don't believe that's the case. Certainly, he might feel that somebody who's specialised in this, who's understanding this every day, I get that. There's definitely a lot of merits, a lot of credit it there but ultimately you have to pay for their time for their wage to ensure they will give you that knowledge I believe though there's so much information out there anyway there's books websites YouTube channels dedicated to the stock market if you're someone who's looking to dip your toes in I don't believe you need that fund manager right away I believe you can gain a lot of experience also a lot of trust and loyalty to the stock market for your long-term growth portfolio because you've actually done it yourself you've researched your fund you've found out exactly what you want to buy into long term, you're taking that risk element because you know things can go up and down depending on the economy, but you've taken the plunge yourself. When you give someone your money, as we've seen time and time again, there's an element of detachment, almost like this person should know better than I do with their money. There's no guarantees. It's kind of like with your own family, I think. You're the one, if it's your children, you know you look after them, you feed them, clothe them to the best of your ability. Somebody else might do that for a short time when perhaps they're at school, but they never do it quite to your standards. I think that's the case with money as well. Somebody might have fantastic intentions to make the most from your money, but it's not their money if they lose it. There's no risk for them. There's no way that they're going to lose all their savings if things don't quite go to plan. And so a mutual fund manager for me seems like a very expensive way of feeling like you have responsibility passed to someone else. So what do I think overall of Dave Ramsey's advice? Well, to be very honest, I have to applaud him for how many people, thousands of people that he has got out of debt and helped in their lives. Truly, it is changing people's mindset with money and it's also including investments in building wealth and giving in his structure. Not a lot of people are confident to say you must be investing. Obviously on this channel, I preach it in some way. I think everyone should be investing as part of their strategy. But he's one of the few people who actually says it as well in black and white. I do though believe Though the 15% is a great way to actually start, because he gives that extra advice of mutual funds, it takes away from it slightly. 15% saving of your household income will generally get a normal working person financially independent within about 35 to 40 years. So a great amount of money to aim for, but certainly just the beginning. Saying that you only should invest in mutual funds that are outperforming the market, then I believe puts you too much at risk of getting it wrong. I also think that you're actually giving somebody more 
of your money when you could keep more in your pocket. It's certainly very much at the start when you're learning how to invest. You're building wealth that allows you to give to others, to start business ideas, to maybe buy out your home quicker. I would rather see those amounts of money that you're starting to invest with grow over time far quicker than perhaps with an account manager. So I passionately believe in index funds. It's where I started as well. I believe everyday people can learn enough so that they do understand how to invest. They learn the terminology, they learn the basics, they learn how to pick index funds, ETFs, bonds, whatever you feel is right. I don't necessarily believe that passing it to someone else is the best decision when you're first starting. This isn't something that's taught in schools. You've very much got to learn it practically. Somebody else can't do your push-ups for you if you like. You've got to get the knowledge. You've got to understand what you're investing in. And even if you do go down the route of mutual funds that are actively managed, make sure you understand what your fund manager is picking, what bonds exactly, what funds are in there. Because if you don't like what they're actually investing in, that's your money. You have a choice there as well. So I hope you really enjoyed today's video. It's been really exciting to dive a little bit deeper into investing advice from somebody else. It's always fascinating to find out what they actually recommend and actually where that comes from, where their own life experiences have led them to make that decision. If you've enjoyed today's video, I'd love if you give it a big thumbs up. All helps with the algorithm. And remember, I don't leave you alone with the stock market or personal finance. I have tons of resources on this channel and my blog, mamafurfur.com. I've got my book, courses. We've also got a spreadsheet system there. There's tons. Go and check it out. If you've enjoyed it as well, leave me a comment. I always like to hear your feedback, what you're investing in, if this video has helped you as well. And remember, I've also added a membership section of this channel. If you hit the join button, you'll see a special message from me. And now I'm creating exclusive content for my members. You will get a Q&A or a live stream from me once a month. I'll be able to answer your questions. And also you'll be getting to help me decide what topics we cover on this channel. So if it sounds like it could interest you, go and check it out a little bit more in depth touch with me for the next months and the years ahead. So thank you so much for watching. I'll see you very soon.